Welcome back to the third edition of our Portland Rising, a production of the Portland Phoenix and the, Ma the Portland Media Center, and we thank them for their help on this. We have a great show today. Colin Ellis, our staff reporter, is going to be interviewing Michael from the ACLU. And our columnist, our monthly columnist, Nick Lund, will give a presentation on migration and some other interesting facts about birds. So to throw it to Colin right now, and Michael, go. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, as you said, we'll be talking to Michael from the ACLU, where he's policy counsel. Before that, uh, Michael was a you know, consumer rights advocate at Maine Equal Justice. And before that, he worked at the Portland law firm, law firm Verrill. Uh, a graduate of Boston College Law School, Michael is also a member of the city's upcoming charter commission. So Michael, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Colin. Yeah, yeah. I know I gave a quick little background there for you, but uh, you know, what made you want to, and how did you become the policy counsel for the Maine ACLU? I um, spent a lot of my spare time as uh, a lawyer in private practice, working on social justice type things. And um, in the course of doing that, I met everyone who works at the ACLU of Maine. And uh, the prospect of doing what I did for free part-time and uh, to some extent pro bono, green-lighted by my law firm, uh, this pro prospect of doing that full-time struck me as very attractive and uh, when there was an opening I applied and uh, uh, probably through some administrative error I got hired. And uh, how long have you been with them? About a year and a half. Um, so I remember when you and I first spoke probably about six, seven, eight months ago, it was regarding the city's effort to put a ban on facial recognition technology. Um, so why do you think that was uh, something from a civil liberties perspective that was important, important for the city? Facial recognition is a very, very dangerous tool in the hands of law enforcement. That's uh, because it poses grave threats to our civil liberties when it works, and it poses grave threats to our civil liberties when it does not work. Let me tell you a quick story about what happened to a Colorado man, uh, a white man uh, who was a banker, uh, very middle class to upper middle class, had a family, kids, a house in the suburbs, uh, I think in the suburbs of uh, Denver, Colorado. One day, a, a, a team of heavily armed police officers came to his house and um, arrested him because they determined using facial recognition technology that he had committed a bank robbery he was uh, arrested, imprisoned, and eventually cleared. But in this entire process, he lost his marriage and he lost custody over his children. And all that happened because of a case of uh, mistaken uh, identity uh, and facial recognition was the culprit. Uh, now, facial recognition technology mistakes everyone's identity frequently but it's especially prone to uh, mistaking the identities of black people, but especially black women and uh, Asian uh, people, especially Asian women. And so the story in Colorado is an illustration of what could happen uh, throughout the country, including in Portland, if facial recognition started to be widely used. There's now a bill in the state legislature sponsored by Portland's representative Grayson Luckner to ban facial recognition statewide. If that passed, we would be the first state to do so. Great, and you know, another thing I know uh, you've spoken about, I think we've spoken about before, uh, is also the uh, police's use of body cameras in schools. Uh, you know, so I know that, you know, with S SROs, at least at some point, maybe temporarily being out of schools, um, you know, is that a victory in banning those, that kind of technology? And, you know, in general, why is prohibiting that in schools important to begin with? Great. You've asked uh, two questions. I'll uh, take them uh, one after the other. The first question is, why should police in schools be prohibited from wearing body cameras? And the second question is, why should police be prohibited from working in schools altogether? Um, the first question has to do with what police do on the streets and what police do 
in schools. And what they do is uh, what they swear an oath to do, which is uphold the laws that govern us. Now, a lot of the laws that govern us, um, if they were strictly enforced in every scenario where they could potentially be applied, would criminalize a lot of our behavior. For instance, in a, in a school, if a kid is walking down the hallway and uh, they're going through puberty, they're having a particularly bad day, they kick a trash can. That could be interpreted as criminal mischief, which is a crime under Maine's statutes. If a kid is tussling with another kid, uh, either consensually or non-consensually, maybe it's a friendly fight, maybe it's not a friendly fight. That could be uh, interpreted as assault uh, or assault and battery under Maine statutes. All of these behaviors that students engage in and that we engage in day to day uh, through the eyes of a police officer who has sworn to uphold the laws of Maine are potentially criminal. Uh, and what that uh, means is the very presence of a police officer in school uh, has a strong chance of criminalizing ordinary student behavior. Now, when you add a camera to the body of the police officer who's looking at this behavior, what that camera does is it multiplies the pairs of eyes that uh, perceive student behavior. And it also uh, stores footage of student behavior in a police server um, where many police officers a week later, two weeks later, a month later, can um, uh, find criminal behavior. And so the very presence of police in schools criminalizes student behavior, but the presence of police in schools with cameras on their bodies further criminalizes student behavior and strengthens what researchers and advocates have referred to as the school to prison pipeline or the school to supervision pipeline. What this means in short is ordinary student behavior, de developmentally appropriate behavior gets treated as a criminal infraction. The behavior gets referred to a prosecutor, the prosecutor brings charges, and uh, next thing you know, the student has a criminal record, is entangled in the criminal legal system, and is possibly incarcerated. What that does is it starts the student, it starts the young person uh, on a journey into second class status, having a criminal record, having any sort of, sort of entanglement with the criminal legal system dramatically magnifies your chances of being passed up for a job, rejected for an apartment, rejected from an institution of higher education, and uh, all kinds of other consequences. Great, great. Um, and so those are two, you know, more specific questions. And this is more general. Are there, you know, what are a few things that the, that you're working on with the main ACLU that, you know, are bubbling to the forefront or you'd like people to know about or you think are important that folks are knowing about in the, in the coming months and year here? We are taking positions on dozens of bills in the legislature. And so if uh, listeners and viewers are particularly interested in a, an issue, uh, chances are that we have weighed in on lots of bills in the legislature that touch that issue. Our priorities right now are reforming Maine's system for responding to substance use disorders. Uh, you know, last year, over 500 people died from opioid overdoses. In the same period, uh, only a couple hundred people more died from COVID-19. Uh, and so we have a major health crisis uh, in Maine, in New England, and throughout the country that's driven by despair and that we've been using the criminal legal system to solve. Uh, we have a list of bills that we're working to push in the legislature that would do all kinds of things to the drug system uh, and to the state's response to uh, drug use that would move the state away from treating um, drug use as a crime and toward uh, treating it as um, a uh, health issue. And um, you know, that includes decriminalizing drugs. It includes the establishment of safe use sites throughout the uh, state, uh, starting with uh, uh, Portland. Um, my view personally is Maine has lots of safe use sites for drugs and uh, those are um, bars and uh, pubs where you can safely consume alcohol. 
uh, which is a drug. Uh, cafes as well, where you can safely <laughs> consume coffee, uh, a drug that I was raised with and uh, that was invented by the country I grew up in. Um, we don't have a similar approach to drugs. Um, Portugal has a program where it has established safe use sites and uh, the results have been extremely uh, hopeful and inspiring. And uh, I think we would save lives to replicate it in Maine. Other legislative work that we've been doing um, focuses on criminalization of other health issues, uh, behavioral disorders, mental health challenges, um, poverty and homelessness. Um, over half of the people in our jails right now have some form of substance use disorders. Uh, what that means is uh, we are sending people to jail because we don't have a strong enough healthcare infrastructure to get people the treatment that they need. Uh, and so a lot of our advocacy in the legislature has to do with not just diverting resources from the criminal legal system to the healthcare system, but creating new uh, unhealthful resources in the healthcare system so that the criminal legal system uh, can shrink to a fraction of a fraction of its current size. And um, I don't know how much time you have, but I can continue down uh, this road if you want. Those are good, but uh, I do want to shift um, for the last little bit here, because I know uh, you're, you personally, uh, in addition to being a member of the main ACLU, you're uh, a member of the city's upcoming charter commission. Um, so you, you were one of almost 40 people who applied to be appointed to that. So I was just curious what interested you in wanting to be a member of this upcoming charter commission. Great, thank you. Um, once again, there must have been an administrative error in uh, my being selected as one of the three charter commissioners. I'm thankful to the uh, uh, clerk who must have made a mistake. But what drove me to apply is uh, the events of last summer, the um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor rebellion um, made me feel a greater sense of responsibility for the structure of my city, of the city of Portland, which I'd lived in for about five years, but I'd never really felt like I belonged to until I met a group of people who had grew up, grown up here. And um, uh, the thing that brought me together with that group of people was uh, the um, response, the mass response, the protests and the demonstrations against um, police violence and structural racism. And um, that made me feel like I had a place in Portland and belonged in Portland. And with uh, a greater sense of belonging, I think, comes a desire to take more responsibility for the community and institutions that one feels like they belong to. And fundamentally, that's what pushed me to apply. I'm also just interested in the legal puzzle and the constitutional questions that arise from the process of rewriting a charter. I uh, wanted to be a part of that process for purely selfish intellectual reasons, um, in addition to the um, reasons I mentioned earlier. Great. Um, and we're just about almost out of time, but I do have one last question for you. Um, you know, this, the actual upcoming race for the Charter Commission, the folks who are going to be elected, it was a very high turnout, kind of unusual for the city. Uh, so what do you make of that? What do you make of that high number of folks who took out papers and, and turned them back in? It's extremely exciting. I think uh, Portland should be grateful that there's a great deal of interest and enthusiasm uh, behind this effort. It's good for a democratic system to uh, generate engagement and involvement. Governments are only as effective and as good as uh, the level of pressure and the level of involvement that um, residents and citizens um, demonstrate. And uh, I think that the events of the last year have increased the desire for political participation among uh, the people who live in Portland. So I think it's a very hopeful and exciting development. And I think it has the potential to make Portland a more engaged 
uh, democracy, that it has the potential to raise the temperature of uh, Portland's politics, which is a great thing. It has the potential to increase the amount of scrutiny that decisions made by Portland's government are met with. These are all great and excellent developments. I'm not a fan of uh, sleepy democracies where only a core group of uh, highly educated and, and uh, well-connected insiders know what's going on. I think what's happening in Portland is that participation and involvement are being democratized. And that's a great thing. Well, great. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate you taking some time to chat with us on these very important issues. And now we're gonna throw it over to Nick Lund from the Maine Audubon. Great, thank you so much, Colin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nick Lund here, staffer at Maine Audubon, columnist for Into the Wild and Birder. And do you guys hear that? Do you hear that? The sound of billions of tiny wings working their way north, beating against the wind. That's right, it is spring, finally, thank goodness. And that means it is time for spring migration. Uh, this is what a good spring migration looks like. Just absolute paradise spinning around in a field of flowers. Um, you can't see the birds, but they're there, they're coming. Uh, and this is what it looks like, a good spring migration. Uh, this is not a photograph, uh, I understand, but uh, hundreds of different species of birds all working their way north, all in their uh, sharp breeding colors, all looking great, um, all coming up, getting ready to breed, getting ready to have babies, getting ready to sing their little hearts out, uh, and getting ready to show off to birders like you and me. Um, let's do a quick numbers check here. So this is a map of the United States showing migrations, bird migrations. So we'll look at the blue arrows here. The blue arrows are spring migration. And right now, starting now, already starting, not quite in the thick of it in Maine yet, but on its way, about three and a half billion birds are flying their way north from the Caribbean, from Central and South America, from Mexico, uh, coming in, coming up north. Uh, about two and a half billion of those will continue on through the United States and head up to the uh, wonderful boreal forests in Canada where they are going to lay their eggs, have their babies, and uh, eat their fill. Um, the orange arrows, just so we're talking about it, is fall migration. Um, about four billion birds are going to be coming south out of uh, Canada in the fall, and about 4.7 billion are going to be coming, uh, you know, picking up the United States and moving south to the Caribbean tropics, etc. Uh, why, of course, is it a larger number in the fall than it is in the spring? Because they all had babies over the summer, and so there's more birds to fly south. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about billions of birds with a B here. Um, I should say, too, if you probably double these numbers to get the birds that are non-migratory or birds that are resident throughout the United States, that gives you an estimate about the total number of birds in the United States, maybe 7 billion or so. So huge numbers of birds. Uh, and what species are we talking about, right? Just some beauties. Let me just show you. This is some eye candy here. Uh, mm. um, these birds are mostly what we're talking about today, mostly neotropical migrants. Um, and some of the most famous are these warblers. Uh, through Maine, we're gonna have about 25 or so species of warblers, these brightly colored songbirds, all with their own um, sharp little uniforms and their own uh, songs. This here with the yellow cap, this is a chestnut sided warbler. You can see that little chestnut markings uh, showing on his flanks right there, real stunner. Uh, this is a magnolia warbler, beautiful, not in a magnolia here, but this is uh, where they like to spend their winters. Uh, beautiful uh, uh, yellow chested, got black streaks down there. This one's singing, so he's a little ruffled up, but um, cool little uh, black eye patch. One of the most beautiful birds in the country is the male scarlet tanager. Uh, this picture does not do it justice. If you were to actually look at this bird in real life, you'd have to like put sunglasses on because it's so gleamingly bright scarlet with those jet black wings. Uh, beautiful bird again. And then another warbler, uh, a common yellow throat it's called. This is a, a funky little guy, like to stay low. Again, this picture not doing it the correct justice. They like to stay low uh, in like sort of watery reeds. Um, very common bird, this sort of black bandit mask and the yellow throat there. Um, these are just some of the millions and billions of birds that are winging their way north right now. Uh, why? Why? Why are we doing this? Why do so many birds, when it's springtime, come all the way up? Um, what is the point? Um, the point is food, right? But 
it's not this food, right? These are the different types of seeds that we stock in our feeders right now and, and uh, keep full uh, for the chickadees and finches and things over the winter. Um, this is food, this is bird food, but this is not the food that is causing billions of songbirds to come flying up from the tropics. What we are talking about is this, uh, insects, right? Insects. Um, these birds are flying up because, as we all know, in the thick of a Maine summer, uh, we're covered in insects. This place is just flying and buzzing and crawling with insects. All of those insects are delicious food for somebody, including these little buggers here. Um, we don't like to see them. I don't like it when they land on me. I don't like it when they're buzzing around my head, but uh, mosquitoes uh, are a delicious treat for some birds. But uh, they really aren't the type of, of insect that most uh, birds are coming for. The number one best type of food, if you're trying to raise a baby, right? If you're trying to grow a young clutch of uh, birds, you want these bad boys, these bad boys, caterpillars. In the spring and summer in Maine, there are, I don't even know, trillions of caterpillars uh, that are, are crawling around. So these are, you know, the young of butterflies, the young of tons of moths that are uh, inching their way along the undersides of every piece of bark and every leaf in the forest, right? And if you are a parent trying to raise a baby bird, there ain't nothing better than a caterpillar. Um, why? They're abundant, right? That's good. They're easy to catch, right? Caterpillars aren't running away from you. You can just kind of grab them off there. And they're full of protein, right? They are growing uh, creatures themselves. And so they're packed full. They're like little protein packed burritos that um, uh, birds can just pluck off um, a leaf or whatever and feed to their babies. And so um, caterpillars are the number one uh, favorite food for these growing birds. And it's the reason, as all of these uh, caterpillars emerge in the springtime, it's the reason that all these billions of birds risk um, a huge migration uh, to fly up. You know, it's pretty dangerous. We'll talk about that in a minute. They're flying, these tiny birds that are the size of your fist, smaller than that, uh, are flying for thousands of miles um, over dangerous territory just to get this delicious little burrito right here. Insects are it, right? Here are some screenshots from a, uh, a, a Facebook group called What Do Birds Eat? Showing different migratory birds munching on insects. There's all kinds of weird stuff, uh, crickets and dragonflies and weird things. I don't even know what they are, some sort of arthropod. Um, about 99% of birds in the United States, terrestrial birds, maybe not seabirds, but birds on land, uh, either eat insects or feed insects to their young. Uh, including birds that don't eat insects any other time of year. So for example, your cardinals, right? Your cardinals that are coming to your feeders, they're coming and, eats and eating seeds. Uh, but when it comes time for them to raise their babies, uh, they don't feed them seeds, they feed them insects. So even those, even those um, seed eating birds. So I want to pause here really quickly because insects are super important, right? So as we are coming up on the spring planting season, um, Maine Audubon and Everyone who knows how to, who wants to protect migratory birds, protect native species of birds, um, encourage you to plant native plants that are plants that are have evolved to uh, be at home in the main climate, because those plants have a great relationship with native insects, um, and we need lots of those caterpillars. These aren't pest insects. I'm sorry, I showed you the mosquito slide a minute ago. We're mostly talking about caterpillars that turn into moss that you never see. They don't bother you but they're very important. So if you want to have a backyard that is full of birds, full of life, um, plant some native plants back there and that's how you get it done. Okay, cool. All right, let's go back to migration. Um, we are learning a whole ton about how birds migrate and exactly what times they do it. Um, this is a little video slide, animated slide from eBird, which is a big bird reporting database. Um, showing bird migration. So this is an Eastern Phoebe. These birds are here now. They winter in the Southern United States and boom, April, May, um, these birds flood up here. Um, Eastern Phoebes are famous for being one of the earliest migrants in spring. They are here now in April. So if you could hear um, a little gray flycatcher singing in your backyard, it may be one of these birds. Let's show another map. So this is a wood thrush. Wood, wood thrushes uh, spend their winters further south. This bird's, you know, in the Yucatan in Central America. And here we go, starting in January. Let's get this thing playing here. Uh, February, March, April. And you can see that, boom, in about mid-April, May, they flood across the country. Um, 
an unusual pattern here. Watch how they jump from the Yucatan straight across. You notice they're not going up around Eastern Mexico. They, they gather in the Yucatan, they jump right across the Gulf of Mexico. It's pretty incredible and pretty dangerous. Um, this is not an animated slide, but I wanna show you here another, this is a bird called a morning warbler, a beautiful little warbler. Um, and I want you to notice here, this is a little harder to see, but you can see the purple down here in, in uh, Panama and Colombia and Venezuela. Um, that is the wintering area of the morning warbler. And here's their breeding area. See all the purple up in Canada, United States. I wanna point this out because it's, um, the difference between the Panama, the these winter range and the northern range is a much, it's much tighter in, in the winter. Um, a lot of conservationists think about, um, you know, making sure we protect not just the wide swaths of Canadian and Eastern forests where these birds breed, but also the much smaller areas uh, of Central and South America where these, where lots of species are concentrated in the winter. So when we think about conservation, we think, have to think about the north, the, the winter and the summer range of these birds. All right, just a couple of different things. I mentioned all the warbler species up, ab up above. Here are three different ones. They're closer, closely related birds, but they've all evolved different ecological niches. And that has resulted in some very different territories. Um, on the, this here on the left is bluebird, black-throated blue warbler, an absolute stunner. Um, it is sort of a understory bird, uh, high elevation. Sometimes um, its breeding range sort of runs the Appalachians and up into Maine. Black and white warbler, not very creatively named, but that's what it is. Um, a beautiful bird, winters in Florida and comes through um, a, a big swath of the east. And then the yellow rumped warbler. Um, this is a bird that actually has evolved and learned in recent years to be able to eat fruit through the winter. And so it doesn't need to migrate quite as far. Um, and we actually have a few individuals that winter in Maine throughout the winter. Uh, migration is not just for these little songbirds. Uh, of course, our loons migrate. Why do loons migrate? It's not really for food. It's because their breeding areas freeze solid in the wintertime, right? They spend their, their winters on lakes and ponds. Those things ain't going to fly in the winter, so they got to go to open water. Um, so they really only fly as far as they need to, which is mostly the ocean. Um, loons are actually much more commonly seen in the winter on the ocean than they are in the summertime on their lakes. Um, here is an American black duck. They have sort of an, another sort of inland uh, coastal and then um, coastal in the winter and then inland when it's frozen migration pattern. Um, this is the way a lot of ducks do. You can't dabble in a frozen lake so they, they uh, move up and down. Um, raptors migrate too of course. Not all raptors. About 60% I would say of raptors are migratory. Some going very far uh, including this Swainson's hawk which you can see some of their individuals goes all the way down through Argentina. You'll notice that unlike the wood thrush a minute ago, with Swainson's hawks uh, don't like to migrate over water. A lot of raptors don't like to go over water. So this bird is going right through the tight Panama Canal area and up into the United States. And believe you me, if you are in some of these narrow areas in Central America during migration, you can see millions and millions of raptors. It's very cool. It looks like this. So I wanna make sure I'm on my time here. Um, here is another bird, this is a kestrel, uh, another small falcon, they also migrate, um, but don't go quite as far, um, a little bit like that. And then I have to say too, there are birds that don't migrate. Why do you uh, not migrate? It's because you don't need to, your food is fine. You can eat food in the winter. Um, these birds are black-capped chickadee, the state bird of Maine, are uh, uh, cedar waxwing here, and our red crossbill, they've all learned uh, to, uh, to develop a diet of fruit, uh, not exclusively, but they can feed themselves through the winter when there aren't the insects around to eat. Um, so that's why these birds don't migrate. It saves them a lot of time and trouble. All right, quickly, um, about migration, um, mostly happening at night. So right now, every night, uh, if it's the conditions are right, about you know billions of birds are picking up and flying, uh, flying north. It's safer at night, you can avoid predators, generally calmer at night, and birds use the stars, believe it or not, to migrate. Um, how do we know that? There have been tests. Um, birds uh, actually can tell uh, north-south. Um, some people can put a, uh, they did this test where they put an ink pad on the bottom of a cone, uh, and then the bird uh, at nighttime, so they can't see anything, they didn't know where they were going. Um, they uh, could see in the morning which direction the little ink pad feet were going. Um, and when they uh, uh, put stars, they like beamed fake stars above the, the circle, the birds would follow the stars, whether it was north or south or different directions. So we know that they are using the stars for migration. And it's pretty crazy, it's pretty crazy. Some of them are uh, flying just in a few days. Um, this is some satellite tags from a black, uh, black pole warbler down there. 
Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, spring migration, they generally go a little slower. They don't want to get too far ahead of themselves if it's still cold up there. Um, but you can see that in the fall, these orange lines, these birds in about two days, they're smaller than like your thumb, are flying from Maine all the way to Colombia, Venezuela. Pretty insane. All right. As you are preparing for spring migration, how are you going to get yourself ready? Um, there are tools now, right? We are living in a data-driven world. Um, I all I recommend everyone go to this site, BirdCast, from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They use weather radar and timing patterns, all sorts of science, to give forecasts about when really big migration nights might be coming. So check out BirdCast. You can see exactly uh, when to expect lots of birds to, to fly in. And let me tell you, it's coming. Um, the, these are the birds. Look at all these. This is about 30 species of birds that may be in Maine. This is just a small swath. So um, people like me, uh, birders, and everyone out there um, should be ready for spring migration, should be excited, and here it comes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Michael, especially both of you for coming on our show today. Um, a lot of interesting facts. And Michael, the insight on what you're doing with the ACLU, I think, is very important and interesting for those of us who are not connected to that kind of world to be more connected. Also, we want to mention we've been looking in depth at key issues facing Portland and recently investigated the impact of closing the, the closing of Milestone, the one and only drug detox, one of the only detox centers in um, the state. So that is a very important story. I hope you all read more about that. And also, if you didn't see this, you didn't see this anywhere else, we talked to the Portland Councillor Tae Chung, who criticized the local progressive leaders for their insensitivity to the Asian bias. So pick up our paper every week. We're out there everywhere. Give us an email, call us, um, tell us what you're thinking, what your reactions are, or just some news tips. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you again to Michael and Nick and the Portland Media Center. We appreciate you and look for us next month. Thanks, everyone.